Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship. It is a joy to be here with you today in worship of our God. We gather together today humbly, acknowledging the power of God, acknowledging that we are people who need to be led, people who need to be encouraged by Jesus Christ. I want to invite you now into this time of worship, and so let's come together now with our call to worship. As the humble realize their strength, and as the underfed eat and are satisfied, God's love is shown through us. As the stranger finds a friend, and as the family offers forgiveness, God's love is shown through us. As the ends of the earth know of Christ's grace, God's love is shown through us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's join together now to worship our God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to call you together as the people of Christ, as people who worship the incarnate God, who made God's love known to us here in the world, to gather together and pray together our confession of sin. One of the most important aspects of our worship service is we humbly kneel before God and say, God, we have fallen short. Now we do this in the knowledge of God's abundant mercy and forgiveness, But still, we do this with humility, knowing that our God is good and powerful and wants to forgive. So let's join together in confession. Let's pray. Merciful God, you know when we are afraid to love. You know when we are too cowardly to show mercy. Remind us again that perfect love casts out such fears. Surround us and strengthen us with your perfect love, even in the face of our own imperfections. Fill us with a love so strong, with such growth toward Christ-likeness, that we may cast aside our pride and embrace the transforming power of your love. Let's continue in a time of silent personal confession. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't deserve God's love. We haven't earned God's love, and yet God gives it freely. God shows it to us through the person of Jesus Christ, and God calls us into this life of forgiveness, extending forgiveness to each and every one of us who come to God in repentance. So know today that we are forgiven, and be at peace. Amen.
have tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is As we gather to hear God's word today, let's open our hearts, open our minds, and open ourselves up to the Spirit. Let's come together for our prayer for illumination. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, our scripture reading for today, we're going to look at 1 John, the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. A bit of a lengthy passage, but certainly a relevant one today. So let's take a look at 1 John 4, 1 through 16, and let's listen for the word of God. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. 
And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and is now it is already in the world. Little children, you are from God and have conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. You are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God has loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. For we have known and believe the love that God has for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, my paternal grandfather was a veteran of World War II. And when I was growing up, he never spoke about it, never told us stories, never mentioned his experiences. It's only been after his death, after he passed away in 2002, that I've learned much about what he did. It turns out he was the captain of a minesweeping boat, meaning that he and his crew went out late at night in a relatively small boat in the quiet of the open sea looking for enemy mines, big, huge explosives that would destroy boats. And they had a whole set up to safely detect and then detonate mines after they found them. This was incredibly harrowing work as they were under constant threat from gunfire from the shore or from enemy boats or, or missing a mine or improperly detonating a mine. And he saw other boats fail and other boats destroyed, other minesweeper boats. But they did this work so that a clear path could be made through the water so that allied troops could enter into Europe. And then that those troops could free Europe from the undeniable evil that was the Nazis and also then liberate the Nazi concentration camps. That was the part that my grandfather played. And I bet that a lot of you also maybe have stories of family members who fought in World War II. But that's what he did. That was his part to free the West from fascism, oppression, radical nationalism, and the evils of Nazism. Now, as you all are well aware, on January 6th, the U.S. Capitol building was invaded by rioters and armed extremists. And this event led to the death of six people, as we know today when we're recording this, including two police officers who died from being beaten by the rioters. Now, the steps that led to this and emboldened this are being heavily analyzed and will be so, I'm sure, for decades to come. So you don't need another hot take or editorial from me. What I want to note is of the many symbols that were worn and displayed by the rioters. There were symbols of various militia groups, various hate groups, conspiracy organizations, etc. But there was one person in particular who was in the Capitol building, and the picture of this has been all, uh, all over the news, a man who was wearing a shirt that said Camp Auschwitz, referencing the Nazi concentration camp that murdered one million Jewish people in World War II. That means that people 
who subscribed to Nazi ideology, had successfully invaded the Capitol building of the United States in the hopes of overthrowing the government. And I'll tell you, I was so glad that my grandpa wasn't here to see that as the evil that he risked his life to fight was here again. But here's another part that also hurts deeply, was that amongst those symbols of Nazism or neo-Nazism, there in the crowd of rioters were symbols of Christianity, crosses, signs saying, Jesus saves, And for those of us who are people of faith, this is and should be disorienting, disheartening. It shouldn't make any sense. We should ask ourselves, why? Why are the symbols of the God who loves us so much mingled together with the symbols of hate? Let's turn to scripture for some answers. You see here, John, like we just read, like many biblical texts, says that false prophets are real. There are people who come in the name of the faith seeking to deceive us. And we must test the spirits to see what's truly from God. And John gives us this seemingly simple test to do this. He says, every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Now, That might actually seem too easy. I mean, what's to stop a member of a hate group from saying the words that Jesus came in the flesh? But what John means by this is laid out in the following verses. Verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. What the incarnation, that is God becoming flesh in Jesus, is really, what it really is, is an act of love, a sign of love, an embodiment of love. The incarnation is love. So to deny love, to buy into hate, even in God's name, is to deny the incarnation, deny that Jesus came in the flesh. And we are called to do this analysis, to look closely at the actions of all those who claim to follow Christ and look for love above all. If there's no love, there's no Jesus involved. But what we see on display in these riots is one of the most sinister ways that evil works in the world. We often think of evil as standing in stark opposition to good. There's the light versus the dark. But rather, evil in our world operates not by standing uh, clearly against good, but by actually just slightly modifying what is good. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15, he says, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is not strange if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. Their end will match their deeds. Let me give you an illustration here, one that's maybe a, a uh, a, a little less heavy. My dad, my stepmom and I, uh, a few years ago, we had the opportunity to sail a sailboat from Marina del Rey to Catalina, about 26 miles, as the song says, but I think that's actually measured from Long Beach, so a little bit further from Marina del Rey. And we were lucky on the day that we did this, it was a very clear day, and you could see the island out there the whole time, and it was about a four-hour trip. And so it was really easy to just stay on course. As long as you see the island pointing towards the island, we were good. But if it had been a foggy or overcast day, we would have had to set a course and then held that course till we got to our destination. But if that course had been off by just a few degrees, we would have ended up in the middle of the Pacific wondering where we were and lost and stranded. 
You see, that is how evil likes to operate. It doesn't try to get you to completely turn around, but rather just nudges you off course and tells you well, there's no need for adjustment. And then after a while, you're miles and miles away from your destination. Some examples. The church. The church says we care about family. We do. We care about families. We love and support families. Evil says, well, yeah, us too. But let's take that to mean just one type of family, only one expression of family over all others. Church, the church says we care about history and heritage, as we do. I love talking about history. I love talking about our Presbyterian heritage. But evil says, yeah, we do too. We love history and heritage too, but let's set up a hierarchy and let people know which is the best heritage over the other lesser heritages. Church, the church says we care about order and structure. We certainly do. As the members of our session know, we like to keep things very orderly. But evil says, yeah, we do too. We care about ev uh, order and structure too. But let's use violence to uphold the order that we want as we see fit. That's not an exhaustive list, and we could say many more, but I hope you can see how evil doesn't turn you around, but just nudges you. My good friend and colleague, Darren Pollock, who teaches at Fuller and uh, pastors a church out in the valley, he makes the argument that the book of Revelation that uses a lot of numbers and symbols, he talks about the, the number of the beast. And he says that uh, the number seven is often used for perfection, godly perfection. And so the number of perfection might be 777. So then we think, well, what would be the number of evil? Well, maybe 000 or 111, something like that. But no, Revelation says that the number of evil, the number of the beast is 666. Not the total opposite of 777, but just one digit off, just a little bit off and enough to be wrong and evil. So now we might ask ourselves, how do we guard against the powers of evil constantly trying to just nudge us off course into disaster and death? Well, one answer, and we already know it, repentance. And that means always leaving the door open for saying to God and to each other, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I made a mistake. It's through repentance that we're able to make those course corrections, able to adjust our heading to get back on course. But when the door to that is closed, when the door to repentance is closed, it becomes easier and easier to get off course. And that, I would say, is why we have our confession of sin each and every week. That's a crucial part of our heritage to always be in the practice of saying, we're sorry. We made a mistake. And we do this not to beat ourselves up, but to keep ourselves on course. And we do it in confidence of God's love, that God is a forgiving God who calls us to repentance. And that, brothers and sisters, is the good news. That our God of love calls us into relationship, calls us to renewed life, a life of love, a life of meaning, a life where we get to show God to others through our acts of love. So friends, let's turn from evil. Let's stay the course. Let's repent when we need to repent. And let's live in the love of Christ. Amen.
People who live in the love of Christ, who know the love of Christ, who want to show the love of Christ to others, let's come together now to pray. Let's reach out to our God of love. Let's lift up the concerns that are on our hearts today. I want you to think of anybody in your life, someone who God has placed in your life, someone that you can lift up today as we pray. Lift them up to God. Say, God, we need to see you here in this place. Let's go to God with a word of prayer. Almighty, all merciful God, through Christ Jesus, you have taught us to love one another, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and even to love our enemies. In times of violence and fear, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts so that we may not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Help us to see each person in light of the love and grace you have shown us in Christ. Put away the nightmares of terror and awaken us to the dawning of your new creation. Establish among us a future where peace reigns, justice is done with mercy, and all are reconciled. Lord Jesus, help us to love one another, for when we do, we are loving you. 
Holy Spirit, we dare ask you to help us to love more fervently, to love when love is hard to do, and to remember that when we love, it's only possible because you first loved us. Lord Christ, apart from you, we cannot bear fruit for the kingdom. Live in us for the sake of your church and help us to be your love-filled disciples. Holy Spirit, when we seek violence, help us also see the sadness of your heart and seek instead to be your peacemakers in our lives. Lord Jesus, healer of our bodies and healers of our souls, hear the names of all those who are in need of your touch today. We lift those up to you. We lift them up to you knowing that you love us all and that you care, that you are a God of healing. Help us listen closely to your word, even as you listen closely to our prayers. And hear us now, Lord, as we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you now to this time of offering, a time where we take some of the abundance that God has given us, and we return it to the church to do God's work. We take these resources, and we say, God, dedicate these towards your purposes, so that your love can be proclaimed out into our hurt and broken world. See up on your screen ways to submit your offering. We give thanks to God for always, always providing. So let's pray together now our prayer of dedication. Lord, we thank you because you give to us abundantly. We pray, Lord, that the offerings that are given to your church will be used faithfully, that they will be used justly so that your love can be loudly proclaimed so that we can go into the world living in a manner of love so that Christ can be made known. Pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, God first loved us, and because of that, we are able to love God, and we are able to show love to one another. So we are called to go out to show that love, to live that love, to embody that love just as Christ did. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace and show the love of God. Amen.